Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Music Treasury, rare and, record, uh, and historic performances of classical music. I'm your host, Gary Lemko. It's uh, you're listening to 90.1 Stanford and KZSU. And my guest this evening is a Scottish pianist who came to my attention through his wonderful recordings on the Divine Art label, Andrew Wright, and particularly the art of transcription. We'll be introducing Mr. Wright in a moment. Mr. Wright was born in Dundee, Scotland, and showed an early interest in music, having lessons and giving public performances at the age of 11. He studied with Dr. William Stevenson and latterly with Kenneth von Bartholdt and Nicholas Pope. In addition to his performing career, Mr. Wright has an active interest in composition and improvisation, which you'll hear the benefit of in a few moments. During his studies, Andrew acquired a conviction that much of the conventional repertory is overexposed, and there are many hidden gems to be found in the works of lesser-known composers, and we hope to expose to you some of these even th this evening. The belief resulted in a detailed study of the minor figures of 19th century music and early 20th century piano history, and a series of transcriptions, A Night at the Opera, an album of transcriptions and paraphrases was taken, and that was released least here in America as the operatic pianist, which came to my attention in its volume two. Let's begin this uh, tribute to Mr. Wright okay. with his own transcription of Vincenzo Bellini's. We're going to hear the fantasy on La Samvilla, the sleepwalker. Music by Bellini, as transcribed by our guest this evening, Andrew Wright. We've begun a tribute to the operatic pianist, Andrew Wright, with his own transcription of Bellini's La Sonambula. Uh, Mr. Wright, can you hear me today, or can you speak? Y y yes, yes, sir. Oh, that's great. You're coming over very very nicely. Uh, let's back up a little bit. In in your notes to this particular cut, this particular selection, you talk about uh, Liszt and Talberg. Um, how did you decide how to splice your own arrangement together? Well, th this particular arrangement largely arose from improvisation, and I think as a consequence of having played and worked through s so many pieces of this type of genre, a lot of the Liszt and Talberg techniques which they use in constructing the paraphrases got absorbed into uh, my improvisational style. And so therefore there wasn't a conscious process of, well, I'm going to use Liszt heat for this bit and I'm going to use Talberg for this bit. It was just a, a, a sort of symbiosis of their general overall techniques was, was used. So the, there, are, there are chordal passages in that piece, for example, which are very typical of Liszt. And the arpeggiated section towards the end is uh, very typical of Talberg's infamous so-called three-hand effect. Now, how did you come upon Talberg originally? I mean, he's not a composer whose name comes up on radio or in conversation very often. No, no, he, he, he isn't. He's really, for a man who was so famous as a performer in his lifetime, he really has um, pretty much disappeared into the history books. I, I first encountered him on um, a recording that Earl Wilde, the late Earl Wilde, made in 1964, and it was a disc which was actually pretty much dedicated to the lost names, as it were, of pianism. Um, Talberg, Hertz, Hummel, for example. I mean, Godofsky is slightly more mainstream. He was on it as well. And it was um, Talberg's Don Pasquale fantasy that sort of first alerted me to, to Talberg. You let me uh, let me intrude just for a moment and say we are going to play an excerpt from that album, The Virtuoso Pianist, a little later in this program. So that's great. That's much appreciated because that I mean that really was my introduction to Talberg. From there, when I read more about him, uh, I obviously heard uh, and read about him the Moses Fantasy, which is in some ways is the pinnacle of his career because it was the piece that he played at what was effectively an informal um, piano duel with Liszt when they were both living in Paris. Well, this is all very fascinating because there was there was a great deal of, uh, I suppose, competition and rivalry between the two, of who was the more outstanding improviser or virtuoso. Well, yeah, yes, very much so. And uh, by the mid 1830s, Liszt had sort of established himself as the main pianist in um, Paris. Chopin, of course, was living there, but Chopin wasn't really given to the same sort of uh, showcase events that Liszt partook of, because Chopin more or less just played on, in salons and things like that. But um, then, as the consequence of one of Liszt's love affairs, he ended up uh, moving to Geneva to get away from the general sort of press commotion and turmoil of it all. And serendipitously, that's when Talberg arrived in Paris, sort of fresh from in completely independent triumphs in Vienna. And then when Liszt returned a couple of years later to Paris, basically the, the city had formed itself into sort of two artistic camps. 
regarding the merits of the two um, different pianist composers, and that was largely how the duel between them came about. Well, that's fascinating cultural history, Mr. Wright. Can you introduce a little bit to the 1839 transcription by Liszt of Rienzi by Richard Wagner, who of course became his father-in-law? Ah, oh, right. This is Liszt writing in his to a certain extent in his earlier vein because as, as Liszt aged he, um, his compositional style matured and he wrote in a slightly more serious vein but this piece which dates from the um, I think the, the late 1850s um, was dedicated to Hans von Bülow who was ultimately Liszt's son-in-law and um, it was Hans von Bülow who gave the debut performance of this piece it features a, a lot of the sort of flamboyant gestures um, that were used by Liszt and Talberg I mean it, has basically octaves and arpeggios and um, the, the sort of staple devices of this of the sort of virtuoso um, repertoire and uh, it's really quite a, a showy piece I feel. Well, I want to uh, play it for the audience right now. I, I have to make a personal note that my first introduction to Rienzi was an old seventy-eight of Lord's Melchior singing Rienzi's Prayer. And uh, the melody was so enchanting that I decided I would learn more of it, of the overture and several of the arias. So from Wagner's Rienzi, we hear the transcription of Franz Liszt, as played by our guest this evening, Andrew Wright. From his album, The Virtuoso Pianist, or The Operatic Pianist, Andrew Wright performed a transcription by Franz Liszt of the music from Wagner's Rienzi, the opera. We'll get back to Mr. Wright in a moment. A superstar among next-generation pianists, Anna Fedorova, with more than 15 million YouTube views, is going to appear for the Steinway Society Saturday, February 17th in San Jose's Trianon Theater in music of Beethoven, Chopin, Scriabin, and Mozart. For tickets or information, just visit SteinwaySociety.com or call 408 990-0872 990-0872 for acclaimed pianist Anna Fedorova. The San Francisco Symphony presents Garrick Olson performing the Beethoven Emperor Concerto in two performances, Thursday and Saturday, February 8th and 10th at San Francisco's Davies Hall. For tickets or information, call 415-864-6000 or visit sfsymphony.org for these concerts of the Emperor Concerto as performed by Garrick Olson and the San Francisco Symphony. And I'd like to remind you that after the Music Treasury at 9, you can hear Megahertz with our friend Romando. We've got back to our friend, Mr. Andrew Wright. Mr. Wright, that was wonderful playing of the Rienzi. Thank you. Uh, it testifies to an incredible stamina and uh, finger strength on your own part. Uh, the next composer on, uh, we're featuring is someone I had never heard of before I r- read your album and, the, and enjoyed your recording. This is a music by a composer named Jael, J-A-E-L-L. Perhaps you can say something about him. Yeah, I, I, I suspect he's probably, well, that, that's testament to how obscure he is, but I suspect he's probably pronounced Yale because he's of um, sort of Austro-Germanic origin, although um, the reference books say he was born in, in Italy. But um, if, if Talberg was a footnote, then um, <laughs> Mr. Yale is a, is a footnote amongst footnotes, so to speak. He, he, he was sort of loosely associated um, with uh, Liszt's Weimar circle, History tells us that in the sort of middle period of his life, Liszt um, set up camp in Weimar, and uh, he started what were essentially pioneering master classes. And uh, a, lo- a lot of famous and aspiring pianists came to, you know, learn from him and study from him. And although I don't think Mr. Yale was a, f- a sort of formal pupil, he was certainly associated with Liszt. Liszt knew him. He's one of these rare composers where I think his wife is actually more famous than he is. Um, she actually wrote um, two piano concerti, and these have received recordings lately, but there's virtually nothing of, of him out there at all. Well, then we owe a great debt to you for these reminiscences. And uh, if we, with your permission, we'll go ahead to the music. We're going to hear music by Alfred Yale, who was born 1832 and died 50 years later in 1882, which is rather fascinating mm-hmm. because that parallels a century before the exact dates of Glenn Gould. And we're going to hear the Reminiscence de Norma, the opera Norma, after Vincenzo Bellini. And our pianist, once again, and arranger, has been Andrew Wright. You have been listening to music of Alfred Yale, 1832 to 1882, the Reminiscence de Norma, after Vincenzo Bellini. That was performed on an album called The Operatic Pianist, Volume 2, as performed by Andrew Wright. Mr. Wright, that was lovely, and especially the Casta Diva, which curiously Liszt left out of his transcription. Yeah, yes, that, that is a, an, an interesting um, coincidence, that. <laughs> 
well, your playing was just lovely. And of course, you, you do achieve a wonderful legato and singing tone despite all of the percussive aspects that these, uh, these composers want for their virtuosity. Yes, actually, something uh, I think that was really quite um, uh, interesting, that the teacher that I did a lot of work on with these pieces, but um, uh, who you mentioned in the introduction, um, Kenneth Van Bartelt, he said that described these pieces as etudes in projecting the melody, which I think is actually very apposite. Yes, I believe it's quite apt, indeed. Let, let's talk a little bit about uh, your influences, particularly in Sc when I think of Scottish pianism, I think the first name that comes to my mind is Frederick Le Monde. Uh, perhaps mm, yes, you could say yes. something about his own influence on you or w what you think about his work. It's actually quite fascinating listening to um, some of his playing because really it's it's representative of a style that we don't really hear much uh, of, if at all, nowadays. And, of course, he had a direct connection to Liszt. Being, I think he was actually Liszt's second-last pupil. And so he was well-placed to assimilate all of uh, Liszt's teachings and you know, um, sort of perpetuate them so that we could actually have some idea of what Liszt himself played like, you know, through through um, his, his pupils um, c continuing the, the historical tradition. So f when you actually hear him play, you hear quite a lot of devices, like there's a slight asynchronization between the hands, um, which can often be used to sort of separately delineate the um, the bass line and the melody line so that it's it's far easier for the uh, listener to perceive them not strictly simultaneously but the, be aware of their their mutual existences which you, you don't necessarily achieve in the same way of, for example somebody plays in a sort of organ style where all the notes are brought down absolutely in unison for example and of, of course he had a, um, a very interesting singing and uh, flexible but not distorted rubato style, which is uh, again characteristic of what's nowadays called the golden age of pianism. And from him, uh, we, we're going to hear the, his uh, own performance of a list. We're going to hear the popular Liebestrom in A-flat, the, the number three, from the uh, London and Berlin recordings made between 1927 and 1936. But also I'd like to segue, with your permission, directly into uh, Mr. Earl Wilde's recording of the Don Pasquale, and perhaps you could say something about uh, Earl Wilde, his influence uh, on uh, transcriptions and reminiscence. Yeah, yes. Well, I mean, I, I think he was uh, an absolutely fantastic performer in uh, in the city. He was, al he was also, incidentally, he was a fantastic performer of Rachmaninoff. He very clearly had an affinity for Rachmaninoff. But uh, he he brought a certain sort of uh, elegance and charm. Um, to the this sort of material and a, a sort of was able to nonchalantly dismiss the, so, the the inherent technical difficulties as you know as if they almost didn't exist at all which you know I think um, th this fantasy certainly I mean the coda of it adequately demonstrates his capacity for that sort of thing. Well it's exactly that I, I, I tried to move the uh, CD forward so we would hear just the last five minutes of the Talberg uh, arrangement from Don Pasquale. And so, with the permission of Mr. Wright, we're going to indulge in two pianists who influenced Mr. Wright's own style. First, Frederick Lamond, playing around 1929 the Liebestrom No. 3 of Franz Liszt, uh, one of the pupils of Liszt, and then Earl Wilde playing a, a transcription by Talberg of the pa Don Pasquale fantasy after Donizetti from the Van Gogh recording. Those dazzling fingers belong to Earl Wilde in his Van Gogh recording from 1991 of the uh, Opus 67 of Sigismund Thalberg, his fantasy on Don Pasquale. And before that, we heard the historic Frederick Lamond perform Liszt's own Liebestraum No. 3 in A-flat. Well, Mr. Wright, we thank you for these moments because these influenced you. Yes, and, and I, th I think they're, qu they're memorable in their own right as well. May I ask you about another pianist just for a moment because I had the, the opportunity to meet him after he did a show for the Metropolitan Opera on list transcriptions, reminiscence, and paraphrases, and that was George Bolet. Is he someone whom you admired? Yeah, yes, he's very, well, I mean, certainly very notable for the, the sort of velvety tone that he was able to, to generate. He, al he also was quite an interesting pianist in that he became famous only really quite late in his career, despite um, having had really been a very fine pianist and almost totally unknown. Or, uh, and it was, I think it was really in only towards the 70s that he really actually came into any sort of level of public view.
Yeah, I think you're correct. I, I only knew him th really through one album, a performance of Liszt's Concerto in E-flat e with Robert Irving. But other than that, I really didn't know Bolette's work because he played for that m that the movie with Dirk Bogard, the song. Yeah, yes, I, 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 was, I was considering mentioning that, actually. Uh, and he's actually... Um, it's interesting because his playing in there is actually f comparatively barnstorming, but in later life um, he was much more... He became a more refined pianist and um, his tone became the sort of paramount thing. Indeed, indeed. But we're going to end the hour with the Talberg transcription of Casta Diva, which you performed so beautifully in the earlier transcription by Yale. Uh, this one, of course, is by Talberg. Uh, can you talk about some of the distinctions to be made between these two approaches to the Bellini aria Casta Diva? Yes, well, uh, I, I personally feel that um, the the Yale one is it, it's sort of post listian it's it's a highly romanticized version of it whereas Talberg I feel was more of a classicist um, and so it's a, a, a slightly more chaste if, uh, if you like um, version of it and so um, I, not, I've played it not undemonstratively but um, w with that in mind that I feel that it emanates from a classicist's point of thinking rather than a um, you know, a, a pure romanticist. I, I understand. We'll, we'll play it in a moment. I just hope that you'll stay with us for a little bit of the next hour because I, I do want to begin the hour with that wonderful performance of yours of music of uh, uh, Lyapunov and then from there go into Martucci. But you decide because it's very early in, in the morning where you are. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be happy to hang around. Well, I'm, I'm, we're, we're, I'm very delighted that you will. We hear from Mr. Wright's op the operatic pianist, his playing of the Talberg transcription of Casta Diva from... Vincenzo Bellini from Norma. From his album The Operatic Pianist, Andrew Wright performed the Sigismund Talberg transcription of Bellini's aria Casta Diva from the opera Norma. You're listening to KZSU Stanford at 90.1 on the Music Treasury, celebrating Andrew Wright, an artist whom I discovered on the Divine Art label with his two recordings of The Operatic Pianist. And that was quite lovely, Mr. Wright. Beautiful. Yes, I, th I think he's presented it very tastefully, to be honest. Yeah, uh, well, I believe so. And I was, because we were delighted with the Mr. Lamont's playing. The, the natural rubato was just astonishing. It has smooth. Yes, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And as, as I said, I think it's a, it's a style of play that is uh, largely lost. You don't really hear people playing in that particular manner nowadays. But it's very effective, I must say. Oh, I, I, I agree, yes. Very effective. Let's talk about a gift that you made to me. And this is of music by Lyapunov, who's, again, a Russian composer who's fallen into something of uh, anonymity to a certain extent. I can only think of two pianists who come to my mind, Michael Ponty, and then, of course, uh, the great uh, Laos Kentner, or Louis Kentner, as he was known. And uh, I admired his recording of the Transcendental Etudes for a long time. And here you are playing one of the Etudes, number five, the so-called Summer Night Etude. Maybe you can tell us how you came to this music. Well, well um... It's perhaps no coincidence. It, it was actually through that um, the Louis Kentner disc that um, I, I came across it in the first place. And uh, I must say, when I when I when I got that disc, I was I was really quite enchanted with it. And I, I still think it's it's a it's a fantastic uh, historical document. And it's uh, we sh we should be very grateful that it was made. Really, to be honest, because without it, I'm not sure anybody would have followed. I, I believe you're right. I mean, because I, I knew him, of course, as the uh, related to the Menuhin family. Mm. And uh, he did perform in New York. Uh, he performed the, the B-flat, the Brahms, with Dimitri Metropolis, which uh, actually has managed to survive on, on disc and is a wonderful performance. He had, he had tremendous range and technique. What, what are some of the demands that Mr. Lyapunov asks of you in this particular piece? Well, this um, piece, I think it's, it's really primarily... Uh, an exercise in um, colour and um, voice projection, for example, y you don't want all of the things that are going on within the hand to necessarily sound all at the same volume, because some of it can be accompanimental and some of it can be melodic. Um, there's actually some very awkward passages towards the um, climax of that, if I remember rightly, where the, the left hand is, is having to deal with these sort of technical issues. I see. Well, uh, no more ado. Let's listen to Transcendental Etude Number 5 from the set of Lyapanov Etudes. And this one, Nuit d'été, is performed by my guest this evening, Andrew Wright. Mm -hmm. 
Summer Night, the Nuit d'été of Lyapunov, as performed by our guest, Andrew Wright. Mr. Wright, that was lovely. Thank you. I think it's a, a really uh, languid and pleasant atmospheric piece, to be honest. In, in, indeed. And, of course, I was, I was just listening to the quality of your trill, and I was thinking, my goodness, this would be wonderful for not only Chopin, but also for someone like Messiaen and some of his bird pieces. Yes, oh, that's an interesting point, actually, yes. And I've, never, I've never really looked at any Messiaen, to be honest. Well, I, I think maybe even the 20 regards of the infant Jesus might be up your alley. I mean, I wouldn't deny it. It's just really wonderful. Uh, I would just want to mention that we're going to hear some music of a composer whom I only know from his orchestral work. We're going to hear some music by Giuseppe Martucci, uh, one of his transcriptions, uh, particularly of the La Forza del Destino of Giuseppe Verdi, a concert fantasy. Now, I only knew his name because Arturo Toscanini occasionally would perform some orchestral piece by Martucci, and uh, I didn't know much about him, although, again, it seems that he's a connection to uh, Liszt and Talberg. Yes, there's a, there's a connection through the teaching side vis-à-vis -vis Talberg. Um, this, it's practically a piece of juvenilia, which is uh, one of the reasons why people probably won't hear it. It's actually his opus one, and it was written when he was 16, incredibly enough. Incredibly enough. And uh, let's see, it's uh, La Forza. Uh, uh, does it deal particularly any, with any of the particular arias from La Forza? Um, well, the, the, the material in it I was largely familiar with, and one of the things that attracted to me to this piece was I have this uh, childhood recognition, um, recollection rather, of a tape off the radio of the um, the overture from the opera. Yes, and, uh, I think a, a lot of the stuff emanates from the overture. Yeah, from, yeah, from the da 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 dum, ba da dum, da 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 that business. Yes, indeed. Well, let's hear it then in this wonderful recording uh, from the fifth and sixth of September, two thousand twelve, from Edinburgh and Reed Hall. We're going to hear Mr. Andrew Wright perform Martucci's Concert Fantasy a La Forza del Destino. Well, if you felt that was destiny, you were correct. That was the fantasy by Giuseppe Martucci of themes, particularly from the overture of La Forza del Destino of Giuseppe Verdi, as performed by Andrew Wright. We'll get back to Mr. Wright in a moment. I just want to mention that Anna Fedorova, uh, Fedorova, pardon me, who is going to appear at the Trinon Theatre on February 17th for the Steinway Society. Ms. Fedorova will perform music of Beethoven, Chopin, Scriabin, and Mozart. For information, just visit SteinwaySociety.com or call 408-990-0872. The San Francisco Symphony presents Garrick Olson performing the Beethoven Emperor Concerto in two concerts, Thursday and Saturday, February 8th and 10th at San Francisco's Davies Symphony Hall. For tickets, call 415-864-6000 or visit SF sfsymphony.org for these performances of Garrick Olson with the symphony performing the Emperor Concerto of Beethoven. And of course at 9 o'clock till midnight, stay here on KZSU for <coughs> Megahertz with Raimundo. I think I'm losing my voice, but we'll, we'll hear the piano of Mr. Wright instead. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. Wright, can you talk a little bit about your own transcription of the Verdi Miserera from Il Trovatore? Um, that, that was one that was completely initially an improvisation. Basically, <coughs> what happened was, well, to some extent, I was improvising on the list uh, miserere paraphrase. And um, c certain bits of the improvisation became not set in stone, but consistent between progressive re-improvisations on the previous improvisation, as it were. And then... Um, uh, a uh, sort of level of editorial cleaning was uh, <laughs> um, applied to the process so that uh, um, the, the sort of uh, rather less uh, <laughs> stylish, shall we say, segments were removed and eventually it was put together as a compositional whole from that sort of improvisational genesis. If I know this piece, it relies heavily on the uh, impression of bells, bell sounds. Yeah, yes. There's, well, there's, there's uh, the tolling of bells in, in, in the opening of, of the... Uh, and because listening, uh, listening to it, listening to it, I mean, I was thinking you should be playing Rachmaninoff yourself very shortly, <laughs> and some of those wonderful <laughs> etudes yes. tableau. Let us listen to Andrew Wright's own transcription from an improvisation on the Verdi Miserere from Il Trovatore. You've been listening to what Divine Art uh, advertises as the first commercial recording of Andrew Wright's own transcription of the Miserere from Il Trovatore by Giuseppe Verdi. Quite astonishing virtuosity there, Mr. Wright. Um, it's a, it was a lot of work, let's, let's, let's put it that way. Um, it, it is demanding to get all, all the alternate chords and octaves and uh, 
um, other accoutrements correct. And sure, if one were interested in your transcriptions, who publishes your uh, transcriptions? Um, well, the, I, I have them available. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm certainly willing to um, pass them on sort of privately. They're not um, published through any official sources, though, at the moment. I see. I'm just curious. And, of course, I want to mention to our listeners that these musics that we're listening to, these selections, are from two albums from Divine Art called The Operatic Pianists, Volumes 1 and 2. And I'm sure people can do something about that if they're interested. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your version or your interpretation of Camille Saint-Saëns as a practicing pianist and artist? Um, I, I suppose, in some senses, he, he typifies, typifies, sorry, um, a lot of stereotypes that you have about um, French art, in that um, there's this sometimes this perception that he's sort of quite deft, uh, um, sorry, quite deft, but at the same time possibly a little shallow. And Sansons really was an absolute master of writing. For example, the piano concerti, which are wonderfully joyous. Um, but not serious in a Brahmsian sense is what I'm trying to get at. Yes, well, of course, uh, uh, Clara Schumann had a very low opinion of Saint-Saëns. She called him an, uh, an acrobat at the keyboard. But any people, anyone who knew him said he was really quite an astonishing musician in every aspect. Yes, I, I think, I mean, Liszt was actually quite taken by his pianism, and that's saying something. I, yes, indeed, indeed. And, of course, his etude, over 52, number 6, that and uh, is very famous on its own as an etude. And, of course, his lovely little uh, scherzi, that little thing called The Wedding Cake, I've always enjoyed that very much because I remember hearing Grant Johannesson play it with such dexterity, and now Stephen Huff is making quite a spectacle of his music. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I mean, I, th I think he was a, a purveyor of s some really um, tasty morsels, but he, he did write some serious music. We have to be fair to him as well. Well, w we we're going to hear an excerpt from uh, Thais of Massenet's famous uh, music, of course, from the Meditation, which is so famous uh, on its own. And uh, you know, it's, this was the setting. A uh, second half of the paraphrase uh, does rework the material, usually associated with the violin and the, the meditation. Is there anything you'd like to say particularly about this transcription from Thais? Um, well, I, I think, firstly, the remarkable thing is that nobody appears to have recorded it in its entirety. I mean, you can fi find performances of the, as it were, quote, famous bit, but um, the, the, f the first half nobody actually seems to have made any commercial recordings of, which... Um, I, I was really quite surprised to find that, you know, in this day and age, and with a composer as famous as Saint-Saëns, that that could actually be the case. Well, let's waste no more time in keeping the audience from it. From Andrew Wright's Operatic Pianist, volume number two, we have the Saint-Saëns concert paraphrase, L'Amour de Thaïs, after Jules Massenet. Once again, our pianist is Andrew Wright. That was a transcription by Saint-Saëns of the music from Massenet's Thaïs, as performed by Andrew Wright. Mr. Wright, that was quite lovely, and I would love to suggest to you that you do a transcription of My Heart at Thy Sweet Voice from Samson by Saint-Saëns. Right, that's, that's an interesting thought, because I, I, as you know, I do, I do like uh, <laughs> making transcriptions, so I'll, I'll, I'll certainly give that some, some thought. Uh -huh. Well, I don't want to be accused of, you know, trying to, uh, you know, intimidate anybody, but it's just that your playing is so lovely, and I can just imagine how that wonderful aria would sound. We're going to segue into a piece as transcribed by Theodor Leszczycki, who was so well known as a teacher of people like Arthur Schnabel and others, like Moisevich. Perhaps you could say something about what you think of him as a composer and arranger. Well, th there's actually very little of him that's uh, um, generally available at all. So, I mean, this is honestly one of the very few works that I was actually able to find of his and so uh, I'm, I'm not actually best placed to make an attempt to evaluate him as a composer I mean at this particular piece it's um, it's rather like he's taken the the list the parallel list um, transcription and converted it from two hands to one which is quite interesting it is I, I mean, I see on your the notes that it's Opus 13, so I must assume that Mr. Leszczycki has some other opus or opera available he, to us. Yes, I, I, th I, think he, I, mean, I think he actually wrote quite a lot of stuff. I mean, I have this residual feeling that um, there's, there's at least sort of 50 pieces of salon music uh, kicking around somewhere, but um, I don't think there's a huge amount of his stuff on um, the Petrucci Library slash IMSLP, which is a very useful resource. So... Um, if there is stuff of his around, it's possibly in the hands of collectors. I, I don't know. I'd have to 
um, do more research regarding that. Well, let's listen to your play. We're going to hear from Theodor Leschetizky, who was born in 1830, died in 1915, the Andante Finale from Lucia de Lammermoor by music of Donizetti, particularly the uh, wonderful quintet, as performed by Andrew Wright. From the opera Lucia de Lammermoor, and, uh, of course, uh, with the famous mad scene and everything else, uh, the various letter that Edgardo has to read, we heard the Andante finale as transcribed for keyboard, solo keyboard by Theodore Leszczycki and performed on the operatic pianist, volume two, of Andrew Wright. And again, lovely, lovely playing, beautiful legato and, and singing line from you, Mr. Wright. And uh, the catch and the real selling point of that piece is that it's left hand only, of course. Yes, that's really quite amazing. I, I, that really should be noted on the CD as well. Let me ask you, before we, we sign off and, and say farewell by way of Franz Liszt, that uh, let me ask you if there are any particular projects that you're working on right now and if Divine Art is handling it or you're going elsewhere. Um, well, uh, if I do uh, a third transcription disc, which I, I am putting some th um, thought into, um, then I would, I would certainly be um, delighted to re release it through them. Um, I, I've got some other projects ongoing. For example, I have a, a concerto, a piano concerto it, uh, written, but at the moment it's really only in solo piano form. We'll have rudimentary orchestration, and obviously getting a, a full um, orchestra to perform our concerto is a, is a difficult undertaking. I'm um, sure. Now, we're uh, going to hear you play one of the most famous transcriptions of all, the Liszt transcription of the so-called Love Death from Tristan. Are you also well familiar with that of Moskovsky, his own transcription of this piece? Yes, again, again we come back to Earl Wilde, who did a, a terrific recording of, of that. Um, Moskovsky's is slightly more syrupy, shall we say. I see. Well, that's fair. That's fair enough. Well, let's conclude. First of all, I want to thank you so much for your time, particularly given the importune hour <laughs> at which we are intruding upon you in Scotland and wish you very much well and continued success with your work. We're going to conclude this tribute to Andrew Wright and the art of the transcription for piano with the most famous transcription of a list possibly from Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. We're going to hear the love death of, of Isolde. Once again, our pianist has been Andrew Wright. We've concluded this tribute to the operatic pianist, particularly Andrew Wright, with a transcription by Franz Liszt of the Liebestode, The Love Death, from Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. You've been listening to KZSU. I want to thank my producer, Larry Coran, and Andrew Wright for making this show possible, and my regards to our, my follow-up, Mr. Raimundo, whose megahertz comes on right now. <laughs>